It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Monster Monday presented by DraftKings, America's number one rated sports book app. They got a, another ridiculous offer this week for college basketball. I'll tell you guys about it a little bit later. New week means new award winners. Means we'll have a new spread the word winner at Ross Tucker NFL, at Ross Tucker Pod, easiest contest in America, a new sponsor confirmation email winner. Somebody just sent me, they got some Raycon earbuds. I was at my mother-in-law's yesterday. Her flowers looked lovely. I won son-in-law of the year over my brother-in-law, which was awesome. A YouTube shout out. Just subscribe to the YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Make a comment. You can get the cameo style shout out at the end of the week. Very excited, by the way, for a new week. We might have another quarterback trade. And I'm bringing on one of the best in the business, a guy that I worked with. I said before we brought him on that I worked for him. He didn't like that. So I worked with him. He was the head personnel man when I was in New England. Then he went on to be the executive of the year for the Kansas City Chiefs, with the Falcons for a while. Now he's all over CBS Sports HQ and NFL Network. It's Scott Pioli, and it's Big Show time. The Big Show. Ross, Scott. you're incredible, man. How about you? You like that? that that's intern Casey, man. Intern, I'm telling you. I, I legitimately, Scott, last week I had intern Casey come on on Thursday with Greg Cosell, and I did it yeah. just so I could post on social media She's the greatest intern of all time, and an NFL team has to hire her. That's that's like her dream. And you'll appreciate this since you have a daughter. I legitimately wrote a letter to her parents and said, gosh, I hope my daughters mm-hmm. can conduct themselves like your wow. daughter did that's when cool. they're in college and they have an internship. Like I feel like if my daughter's – we're able to do all the stuff Casey does, and she's punctual, and she does this. Like, I, I, I'll be like, okay, we did it. Like, we, my wife and I didn't screw this up, you know? That's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks for having me on, Ross. Great to be yeah, so, here. So this is really interesting about, about Scott. And I'll just say this. I, I want to bring you on again in the summer to kind of talk about your career. But the thing I can say without any hesitation, Scott Pioli was the most open honest and transparent executive that I think I ever interacted with during my time in the NFL. And it was very much appreciated. And often I felt like weird that other organizations didn't think you could just tell the guy what the deal was. You know what I mean? Wow. Wow. Thank you for saying that, man. I appreciate it. Cause Ross, truthfully, that's, you know, when when you when you when I went to work, that's what I hoped to be. Yes, I wanted to be I wanted to be the best in the business at my job, and I also wanted to be the best person that I could be, the fairest person. Understanding how you know people love to talk about how players in their lives and their situation, oh, they they've got this charmed life. Yes, in certain ways it's charmed, but it's rough, man. I mean, you guys are you know every single day it's it. You might make it, you might not, and and not even do just to talent, but to injury. To so I truly tried to empathize um, with the players and the the coaches, the scouts, everyone I worked with. Because again, people see the glamour part, but these jobs, your job, my job, Bill's job, any other coaches, they're so hard. So thank you for saying that, Ross. It means a lot because um, you know anyone can do a job. It's just, it's kind of how you want it how you want to do it. So thank you. I appreciate that. So um, I, I'm holding you to this. This summer, I want to go over a couple of the scenarios that you and I were in together. And I also want to talk about your career because I, I think I I usually think that talking about people and their lives and their career is more interesting a lot of times than the current events. However, we will have time for that this summer. Right now, there's a lot going on. I mean, there's this quarterback carousel that we think will go on. There's cap issues. I've seen some of your clips on NFL Network where you do a great job 
And let's just start, I guess, Scott, I know it seems like it was uh, a year ago now, but the Jared Goff-Matthew Stafford trade, I guess what I find interesting about it is teams almost never like to have a lot of dead cap or take big dead cap hits. And yeah. here we are with the cap, depending on what people thought it was going to be this year in 21, right? Like between 210 and 220, it's instead going to be 180. What a, isn't it a kind of a weird, bizarre year, Scott, to be taking that much dead cap money on it, your cap when the cap's going down by 30 to 40 million bucks? It really is. And, Ross, I, I don't think that they want it. I know that they didn't want to do it. Um, sometimes teams don't mind taking on the dead money. This year, teams don't have a choice. Because, again, what we've seen, it's been interesting. We've seen teams be able to act financially irresponsibly quite honestly, from a football standpoint. It's one of those things, you know, I was, I'm going to digress here because I was raised in such a way in a household where we had a budget that was really tight and we paid attention to it. Part of what happened was that thought process and th those behaviors, it was the way that I learned the salary cap as well. So when Bill and I did it, we were always thinking about the middle class and the greater good and, and not doing things that where we would leverage ourselves in the future, depending upon how great America is and everything financially is always going to go up. There's going to be bad times. Now, I just use it as a backdrop as to this year. What's happened here consistently, every year except for one, there's been exponential growth in the salary cap. The one year that it didn't happen was the year of the lockout, as we know, Ross, and that changed things. So the way things are now, to have dead money is even more uh, debilitating or potentially debilitating. And Everyone was – no, obviously no one planned on the pandemic. But one thing about NFL life is the NFL is always planning that things are going to grow. So this year it really is very odd. Right, and it's interesting because, I, you know, you, you said a word um, that jumped out to me where teams have been a little irresponsible. Yeah. They, they've always looked at it like – I think a lot of teams thought, well, once the gambling money comes in, once the new – uh, TV deals come in, we can sort of keep pushing things out. And then by 2022, 2023, we'll be okay. And then the pandemic hit yeah. and it goes down 30 million. And I, I'm curious on a lot of different levels. So there's the team part of it. But I was just reading a story about, you know, what guys are free agents for this year. I feel bad for these guys. I, I mean, can you just talk a little bit, Scott, about how many cap casualties you'll think there will be? And there's yeah. a lot of guys that are free agents, and I almost wonder if teams decided, rather than trying to extend some of these guys, let's let them hit the market because the market's not going to be what they think it's going to be because of the cap this year. Yeah, and, and a couple things on that. I want to go back to the irresponsible word in a minute. But to your point, what's going to happen, I think there will be a lot of players – released because as we know this Ross it's just like the cap increases every year the salaries increase there's very few players that have salaries that remain flat from year to year then there's the group of players who have exponential growth in their salaries which they're going to be the ones in trouble so I think it is going to be that way and what will happen more than likely it'll be the kind of year my guess is I don't know this that there'll be a lot of one-year deal signed where younger veterans and veterans will say you know what the money's not out there right now. I'm going to risk it, and I'm going to do a one-year deal and hope to get paid in 2022. And uh, that's my guess. I think that's what will happen. Now, again, there's risk. When you sign a one-year deal, you're not going to get as much signing bonus. You're not going to get as much guaranteed money. And then there's the risk of injury or something else happening. So uh, I think that that will be one of the uh, you know unintended consequences of, of what just happened here. Um, but going back to the irresponsible part, you know, it's funny. One of the things that, I, that I've noticed, and it just wasn't the way that I, I was raised in managing a cap and managing finances, is there's people who are desperate about their jobs, right? There's people who have this thing, just like players, Ross, all the insecurities that players have, coaches have it, front office people have it. And in the back of their mind is, if I don't go out and spend that money now, I may not be here in a year or two years. I don't care what the cap is. I'll worry about that when I get to it. And how many teams have we watched over the years, Ross, who go out and do that kind of thing and don't make it? 
Tampa Bay did it this year and they won. So, right, it's a gamble. It's kind of like going to the casino. You're going to go out there, you're going to put it out there, and you better hope that you win or win enough to keep your job. And But I, I just don't – I'm not a big fan of the irresponsible spending um, because once you do it, the chance to sustain success or sustain greatness, which, Ross, you were there in New England. You saw how we did things from a business model standpoint. We wanted to win as badly as anyone. We wanted to pay players as much as we could without being in, a, in something that wasn't sustainable. So you mentioned Tampa, and I think that's a, a good jumping off point because they obviously bring in Brady. They win the Super Bowl. Do you think that is one of the reasons why people are projecting anywhere between 16 to 22 new starting quarterbacks around the NFL? I mean, we already have seen a couple. There will be more. Do you think – because I've heard people call it the Brady effect where a lot of teams didn't try to get him last year, Scott. A lot of people say, ah, nah. And then he goes to Tampa and wins the Super Bowl. And then also, I think a lot of teams say, well, you got to have somebody that's even – gives you a chance against Mahomes or someone like that. Do you think that's part of the reason why everyone is wow. seemingly predicting all kinds of quarterback movement over the next couple months? Well, I think it's a combination of things, Ross. I think you're hitting on a point that what happens is that success or, or that behavior being rewarded with success, right, it's Pavlovian. and people will do something because they've seen success and they know it works, so let's do that. But let's go back to what happened before that actually worked was there was that, you know, I call it musical chairs of quarterback, not the carousel, because what happens is in musical chairs, everyone's fighting for a seat. All of a sudden, someone get, someone's going to get left out of this carousel. So to me, it's more like musical chairs. And I, um, I, I think it started last year. People didn't know how this was going to work out. And again, what's interesting is there's this other part of, of the football landscape that is making this happen too, right? And it goes back to coaches getting fired quickly and general managers now getting fired quickly. And people are more in the now. And they're thinking about, I don't care about building a long lasting program. I care about getting at least one of those trophies because that gets me a shot at another contract and sustaining my ability to survive. And I think part of what's happening isn't just the Brady effect, is people have wondered if that would work, if they could do that. Because go back in the past, there's been teams, I mean, heck, Joe Namath was traded for, right? They were, they, I mean, that, that's a long time ago, but this has happened before where teams, you know, where um, Joe Montana, let's go back into the 90s, you know, he was, he was, I can't remember if that was a trade or free agency, but he changed teams. So people are trying to capture. People are uncomfortable. They don't know how much time they have. They're trying to capture lightning in a bottle to get to survive and get to the next contract. Just like it's a it's a fascinating dynamic that I've watched for years. Again, Ross, I've done 27 years in this league, and I watch the behavior of everyone. People love to focus on the players, you know, uh, on the coach and front office side. And say, oh, look how this player's acting. That's because of their ego. That's because of this. They just want money. But you, you know what? Most everybody in this industry behaves that way. It's it's such a great point. We so often talk about players acting in their best self-interest, and obviously fans are like, he should do this for the team or whatever. Right. But, yeah, I mean, there are situations, certainly Chicago, I expect them to be very aggressive. You know, all the guys that kind of know they're on the hot seat going into this year, I do think it's interesting, though, what the Rams are doing. I was so glad you brought that up. Yeah, because those guys aren't really on the hot seat. You know, your Patriots teams were really categorized and what people talk about them is how strong the middle class was of those teams. Scott, yeah. the Rams are going the exact opposite model. They've got like six guys making 15 million or more. I think almost every other guy makes the minimum. It's unbelievable. I, I, I've never seen a team constructed like this Rams team. And Ross, I, when I talk about those things, I'm not criticizing them. I understand this league. Again, I think there was a point in time when I was younger when I did because I think when we're younger, we understand our way. We don't really want to realize or recognize that other people can be as successful doing it differently. And I look at that model and 
you know, you talk about, we were just talking about it earlier. In 2018, hey, they loaded for Bear in 2018 when they made all the amount of money they spent in 2018, or I should say in capital that they spent in order to extend golf to, um, to get Jalen Ramsey, what they gave away in financial, you know, in, in capital there and then in draft capital and what they've continued to give up in draft capital to get one now is exactly what we're talking about. And that's how they've built their team. And, and I'll say, Ross, you know, that's how we chose to build our football team and back in New England. Interestingly, there were, you know, Bill and I worked together those three years in New York prior to going up to New England. And something that we talked about that if we ever had the chance, if we were ever going to do it together, we talked about building something that we wanted to win, but we wanted to build something that was so unique, that was so special, that lasted, um, that, that, that we wanted to build something that outlived us. That was the phrase I remember, you know, Bill saying one time, he looked at the greatness of some other programs and, and the people that he, you know, that he respected so much, whether it was Paul Brown, where their legacy of winning was greater actually not, it wasn't necessarily their personal legacy of winning. It was their institutional legacy of, of, of winning that they had been a part of building. And that's what we talked about in New England. And we just felt that the right model was if you have more good players, you have a chance to win. And so what my job was to do was to go out and find a bunch of really good players that could fit what Bill was trying to do offensively and defensively and also be led by his style of leading because once you brought him the guys that he could work with, the guy is there. There's no one like him, Ross. There's no one like him. You, you just had to identify the right players. And a lot of those players, Ross, were the type with a middle class mentality. So uh, last thing I want to ask you is about two guys you drafted back to back years. Uh, one was in the sixth round named Tom Brady. But the next one, Scott, in the first round. Richard Seymour. Mm. And, yeah. you know, he didn't make the Hall of Fame again this year. Unbelievable. And I, I want to get, I want you to t talk about this because sometimes people, I don't know if they don't believe me. I have said, and you know, I started against him three times in Buffalo, right? And then was on, you know, practice against him in New England. He's the best defensive lineman I ever played against. And I played against Sapp and Leroy Glover and Bryant Young and Bruce Smith and what. Seymour was so good in every aspect of it. What's disappointing to me is I feel like the scheme in New England or maybe the Hall of Fame voters' lack of understanding of the scheme is what's preventing him from – and I still think he'll hopefully get in, but I think it's preventing him from going to the Hall of Fame because – I'm not going to say that they don't understand it, but – they don't understand it as well, as well as I do. I feel like, <laughs> yeah, or or they don't want to understand it. And Ross, you, you nail it. And and I, as you know, I'm a huge advocate for Richard getting into the Hall of Fame. I've written, I wrote an article shortly before voting on NFL.com about Richard because I I saw Richard from the beginning through his entire career. So I saw him when he was in his final season. Him and uh, Stroud were at um, Georgia. And I was at the University of Kentucky when they played, Georgia played at Kentucky, down on the field in pregame, scouting, watching this guy, thinking, when I saw him, I was like, oh, my gosh. Because the two places we needed to get better going into that 2001 draft, we knew back in the 2000 season was going to be up front on both sides of the ball. Which, by the way, our second round pick was your boy, Matt Light. Who was yeah. a pretty darn good player himself, and uh, but Rich and both those guys were very good players as rookies on the Super Bowl oh, team. Oh heck yeah, they came in and they, and they contributed immediately. And you know Richard's career. So we spent all those years together in New England, and then when I, in '09 when I went to Kansas City, that's when he went to the Raiders. So I had to face that knucklehead four years in a row, and he kept us. He's the reason we didn't win back-to-back -back division titles in in 10 and 11. He blocked two field goals in regulation uh, to absolutely kill us in, in a game. That, that's the game that kept us out of the division championship. But Richard's, Richard's body type right, was so different at that point in time because he was tall and linear, but he was also thick enough. But for a guy that was built like he is built – to generate the amount of explosion and power and uncoil. And again, I, I can't stand up right now, but the power that he had in his ankles, knees, hips, 
Crazy. Right? It would Crazy. be insane. And, 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 and sometimes people would say, and, and here's the thing is, I'm getting excited now because one of the reasons I'm not sure that he gets respect is because uh, a couple of things. The defense, you know, that we ran in New England was incredibly, the program was about selflessness. The defense was about selflessness. It was a two-gap defense up front. So defensive linemen were responsible for two cap, two gaps on either side of them. They had to do things. He was If he'd have been a one-gap, up-the-field, disruptive guy in a scheme like that, oh, my gosh, he would have had stats. His stat sheet would have looked completely different. But because he chose to do the right thing and be a part of the system, and win championships and let other people win championships, that he did something so selfless for a greater good to win championships and his stats are less and that being held against him is really unfair. And, and you mentioned, and I don't, neither one of us are being disrespectful to some of the people that are important voters in this, but they just don't fully, under, unless you've been, and again, I'm not saying, oh, you don't know because you didn't, I don't mean it that way at all. It's unless you live that life of having to have a selfless life and play within that defense and that scheme, um, it's really hard to understand what he chose to keep himself from. And and I the other thing is, Ross, I think it's the defense he played in, but I also think that team, you know, all of the credit always goes to Bill and Tom or the majority of the credit, and they deserve an incredible amount of credit. But because of the way the culture and the outward culture that we created, I think far too many players that were very, very good players unintentionally have been disrespected. I don't think that the players get it nearly enough because we could go through a list right here, Ross, of all the guys that were really, really good players, whether it was Mike Rabel, Willie McGinnis, Roman Pfeiffer, you know, I mean, Matt Light, we just talked about. There was some – Troy Brown. People remember them for those moments, you know, that snapshot that they played. But those guys were truly, truly good football players. It's a great point. Scott, uh, when I get you on over the summer, we can talk Tom Brady. I just can't believe he's still doing it. It's unbelievable. Thank you so much. Where can people check you out on social? You're at Scott Pioli, correct? Uh, act, I am on Twitter. I actually know this now. It's all it's Scott I, Pioli fifty one. Scott yeah, Pioli fifty one. Exactly. And I don't know if uppercase lowercase matters, but it's I'm lowercase man. <laughs> Got it, Scott. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Ross. Look forward to getting together in the future. There he is, Scott Pioli. I told you that was awesome. I could do. I promised him twenty minutes max. I could do two hours with Scott Pioli just talking football. Do you see how excited he got? when he was talking about Richard Seymour's ankles and knee, I'm telling you, he had the best natural leverage of anybody ever. Unbelievable. Speaking of leverage, by the way, how about this one for, for DraftKings this week? You can bet a dollar on any team to hit a three-pointer, and if they make a three-pointer, you cash $100. Are you kidding me? Have you seen like Creighton or some of these teams play college hoops? Do that. And use the code Ross when you go over there. But go ahead, do yourself a favor, and take advantage of that. All you ever have to know is there's unbelievable offers at DraftKings using the code Ross. Tux takes. All right, Ross, let's start today with the J.J. Watt news. Uh, clearly an end of an era in Houston. The Texans releasing him at his request after 10 years. Right. Now, there's a lot of things that need to be said here. So, first of all, his salary for this year is $17.5 million. I think reasonable minds can disagree whether any team would have really traded anything of value to pay J.J. Watt $17.5 million. I think it's probably unlikely. However, there are things the Texans could have done, right? Like, the Texans could have restructured his deal – and given him a, you know, $10 million signing bonus and then trade him so that the team that took him on, it wasn't blah, blah, blah. They And they also could have waited until the last day. They did neither of those. So I will give the Texans credit for that. They didn't try to finagle away to get a late round pick. 
They didn't wait until the last second and continue to try to get something in return. Supposedly they had gotten a couple of offers. Uh, I don't know if I believe that, but whatever. The point is, is they did the right thing. Because even if you say they couldn't get anything back from him, Ross, they still did it right away. They still did it now, giving him plenty of time before free agency starts to have all kinds of teams calling him. I still think he would end up in Pittsburgh with his brothers. That's such a unique thing. Or maybe Green Bay with uh, the Packers and going back where he's from. Green Bay is also not real far from Chicago, where I guess his wife plays uh, professional soccer. So he's certainly going to have a bunch of opportunities. That's for sure. Tux takes. Speaking of the end of an era, how about the hiring and subsequent resignation of Jaguars strength and conditioning coach Chris Doyle? So Chris Doyle is sort of a legendary strength and conditioning coach who had been the guy in Iowa for years and years and got paid over a million dollars a year. Highest paid strength coach in college football uh, because he got results. And the kids that came into the Iowa program, they left incredibly strong. You think about Tristan Wirfs and George Kittle and people like that over the years. Unbelievably impressive what those people have been able to do. Um, what Chris Doyle has been able to do over the years. Really, really, really impressive. However, you get into a situation where he obviously got fired from Iowa because of what happened. There had been multiple reports, and I guess maybe over 50 players had talked about him having – some uh, racially insensitive comments that people did not like. Uh, there was also conversation regarding 13 guys had to go to the hospital. I don't know all the details there. I just know that Urban Meyer said that he vetted him thoroughly. And then the guy resigned, probably because they asked him to resign, after a day. So he didn't really vet him that thoroughly. Do I believe people deserve second chances? Absolutely. Can people show remorse? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean Urban Meyer has to be the one that hires him in one of his first moves as an NFL coach. And then after a day, gets his resignation. I mean, at a minimum, and I tweeted this over the weekend, at Ross Tucker NFL, Urban Meyer did not do nearly the vetting that he thought he did because he obviously didn't realize how poorly received this move would be. Tux takes. Some other news today includes Tom Brady said to have knee surgery. The Raiders are going to release Tyrell Williams to save over $10 million and the Pouncey twins, Mike and Marquise retiring together after 11 seasons in the NFL. So the Brady news is interesting just because I don't know anybody really knew about his knee. And there's all the talk about Mahomes' toe. And here you have Brady has to get knee surgery himself. Makes it even sort of more impressive what he was able to do again. And then the Raiders releasing Tyrell Williams, kind of what Scott Pioli and I were talking about. It's going to happen a lot uh, over the next couple weeks. They're just – teams are going to have to cut a lot of these veterans that are not making – they're not playing well enough to make the money that they're making, period. They're just not. And a lot of these guys, I think it's going to be a buyer's market for teams. I think you're going to be able to get some good players on some inexpensive one-year deals, which is why I think a lot of these teams are letting this people go ahead and go to free agency because I think they realize the market's not going to be what they think it's going to be, and we can get a lot of these guys back on one-year deals or, you know, they can do a multi-year deal and just have more of the money in years two and three, I think. They'll try to get creative in that regard. As for the Pouncey Twins, that's pretty cool, man. I mean, that, that's pretty cool that they retire together. I think if memory serves, one of them, I want to say Marquise left early, left Florida early, a year earlier than Mike. And Marquise 
might have played 11 and maybe Mike played 10. I, I think one of them was still at Florida when the other one turned pro. I don't know that they came into the NFL at the same time. They came into the world at the same time. I don't know if they came into the NFL at the same time. That's a pretty cool story as well. Uh, shout outs are in order as always. Pizza Boy Brewing, Sportaculture, Steakhouse Sports, Vision Comics with an X, and DinerDepot.com. Scott Pioli was fantastic. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Fran Duffy scheduled to join us on the College Draft Podcast with Emery Hunt, Talking Quarterbacks. Subscribe and listen to the College Draft Podcast. The time is now. Engage. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feasts, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.